So almost five years ago, I took over DREV, and one of my first tasks was to evaluate all the projects we had, because we actually had six projects and three staff. <laughs> um, one was phototherapy, and phototherapy is blue light for severely jaundiced babies. And the way the problem was described to us by an Indian doctor was that um, mothers living in rural areas, particularly where a lot of moms are giving birth at home, don't have access to phototherapy. And this is important, and you'll learn more about it in a minute. Um, as we did some field work, though, um, we saw something different. This is a picture from an urban hospital, so a hospital where very sick children are referred. And you can see here, actually, it's not very effective phototherapy. You've got two children in a bassinet. Some of the bulbs are burned out. Um, and we did some research with Stanford University, and we found that 90% of phototherapy devices in four Indian states and one Nigerian state did not deliver effective phototherapy. So it turned out this was a much bigger problem than we originally realized. Um, so I'm going to zoom out a little bit and talk about <laughs> DREV and our approach to design, and particularly the design of medical devices. And DREV stands for Design Revolution. And we work to improve the health and income of people living on less than $4 a day. And we're structured as a nonprofit. Um, but I'm going to show you a little bit about our approach. So for those of you who are designers, you're going to say, oh, this is a very oversimplified design process. But the main thing is that we take a systems approach. So start with identifying the need, really digging in, understanding the users, the context, the landscape, the price points, everything about the problem. And then moving into more of the typical what we think of design. So prototyping, iterating, conceptual development, you know, this, this process of iterating and, and honing in on what the final embodiment of the hardware will be. And then delivery, and this is manufacturing, distribution, sales, marketing, regulatory approval, all the things you need to get it to the user. Um, and then because we're looking at big problems, so not just problems in single markets, but problems in multiple markets, we're also concerned with scaling. And then as a nonprofit, and we are structured as a nonprofit, we're also interested in measuring impact. So three things to know about us. The first is that we design world-class products. So they need to perform on par or better than the best products on the market. And for those of you who know a little bit about the history of product development for, quote, poor people, you know that it, it's actually kind of riddled with a lot of poor quality products. And we're being very clear that these are high quality products because regardless of your income level, you want the very best product and you want a beautiful product. The second thing we like to say is that we're user obsessed. So in the sense of user-centric design, you know about the end user, you know about the patients, you know about the doctors, the nurses, how they use medical devices. But we're saying you need to know about everyone in, in the language of international development, all the stakeholders, people who repair the product, people who make it, and also the context. Many of the hospitals we work in fre have frequent power outages. And this is a big concern, obviously, if you're designing a product that requires electricity. And the last thing is we believe that products should be market driven, meaning that they need to be sold on the market, not donated and not heavily subsidized. And this is important for a number of reasons. We design them with profit margins built in. We want them to be economically sustainable without further donor intervention. And we also believe that if a user has to purchase a product and it needs to be affordable, um, it also holds us as the designers accountable to our customers. So I'm going to jump in and talk about the Remotion Knee. You heard a little bit about it. And I actually have um, one up here. It's actually not out in the clinic, but it will return there after. This project started with the Jaipur Foot Clinic in India. And they were using um, a lower quality knee. And they came to Stanford University and said, we actually need, we need something that's better quality, but still affordable so that we can use it with our population. Um, the reality is, is if you live on less than $4 a day, like these three men in Jaipur, there are very few options for a prosthetic limb. And so if you're an above knee amputee, just to give you a sense of the leg system, there's a socket that fits over the residual limb, there's the knee, and the knee is the most expensive and complex part of the entire system, and there's a pylon that acts like your shin, and then there's a foot. Um, how big a problem is this, though? There's about 3 million amputees every year who require a prosthetic leg system, an above-knee prosthetic leg system, and aren't able to get one. And you can see from um, the, the image that it's predominantly in sub-Saharan Africa and India. So what are your options if you're an amputee? This is a high-end prosthetic knee. It's about 12,000 British pounds. This is what we would call a smart knee. So you can program it, you can ride a bike, you can drive a car, you can do a lot of things. And this is something that veterans coming back from the war who live in either here in UK or the US would be fit with. But at 12,000 pounds, it's not gonna be affordable to our customers. 
This is a low-end titanium polycentric knee. And what polycentric means is that it's a four-bar mechanism, a four-bar mechanism that mimics the natural gait when you walk. And the neat thing about that is as it's very stable. So as you're walking, the rotation kind of moves through space. But 850 pounds, it's still not really going to be affordable. And then here you have the International Red Cross knee. It's 90 pounds. But where you have affordability, you lose out on performance. As a single axis knee, it rotates. So around, just like it sounds, a single axis. So think like a door hinge. And that's going to be much less stable, because you can imagine as your weight shifts over that axis, you lose stability. And um, you're going to watch a video now of a man named Ash wearing a single axis knee. And this is what the Jiper Foot Clinic was using before, um, before we got involved. So, one thing that's not obvious as you're watching him walk, you can see he's struggling with the stability, is that it's mentally draining to be trying to prevent yourself from falling. So this is the first version of the Remotion knee um, called the Jiper knee. And this is um, a 16-year-old named Kamal. And he actually had lost his leg in a motorcycle accident. He's doing that same 10-meter walk test. And you can see his stability is much better. <coughs> And to be fair, he's a very fast learner. <laughs> Most amputees do not learn to walk so, so quickly. And this was a day and a half after he had been fit. Um, so now we're on the third version. This is the Remotion knee. And you can see it here fully flexed. It's a polycentric knee. This is what it looks like um, in terms of manufacturing. I have one here. Um, and polycentric, again, is just it acts like natural human gait. So the key thing, though, is it's 45 pounds. So much cheaper than everything on the market, particularly for its performance. So in terms of knees in use, the first version, um, the Jiper knee, which I also have here, it's the much kludgier looking one. And if you're interested, I can tell you about some of the design changes, but you might be able to guess just from the clicking. Um, it's been worn by over 5,500 amputees in 12 countries. And this is largely through a partnership with the Jiper Foot Clinic. Interesting, this is the inquiries we've gotten in the last two years. It's, it's been amazing. And we have not done very much marketing because we don't want to do marketing before the product is going to be on the market. And it's supposed to be on the market at the very end of this year. The thing you may note is that these are not all low-income countries. So there's demand in, much, in a much larger market than even we anticipated. <coughs> Our goal is to fit 4,000 amputees in the next five years, or 40,000 amputees in the next five years. Um, I wanted to mention to you a few challenges we've run into, because it's, it's nice to hear about all the things that are happening and going well, but it's also, I think, interesting to learn where there's been some challenges. Um, you're looking at the pr prosthetics clinic in Nairobi, Kenya, and those are four processes. And the day I visited, um, they were very busy, but they weren't fitting patients. And I noticed that there were patients there, but the two didn't seem to be mixing. So I said, you know, are you not fitting today? And they said, well, actually, the foot components hadn't come in. Um, so we're waiting on foot components. And so we saw that supply chain was a real issue. And as we've talked to more and more clinics, the supply, the supply chain issue is a much larger issue. And it's preventing amputees from getting remobilized. So one of the things we're doing at DREV is we're considering bundling all the components with the knee as we ship them to clinics and hopefully address this problem. Um, the other issue that we saw is that there's just not enough skilled prosthesis to, to, to meet demand. We're planning on fitting 40,000 amputees in the next five years, but you see the demand is much higher. And while there's funding going to prosthetics colleges, this is a very real challenge. So we're going to move on to Brilliance. Brilliance is a phototherapy device you heard a little bit about. Um, I'm going to give a quick primer on jaundice. About 60% of all infants have some degree of jaundice. And of those, 12% in richer countries, so here or in the US, um, need to be treated for severe jaundice. And if children are not treated, they can suffer from brain damage or death. In low-income countries, the rate is higher. It's about 17% that need treatment. And the rate is higher because of lack of antenatal care and also a higher predominance of G6PD, which is just a genetic marker that makes you more prone to, to jaundice. So the thing to know about jaundice is that it's also time sensitive. And that means that as soon as it's recognized, a child needs to be treated very quickly. And it is the number one reason why babies worldwide are readmitted to hospitals. And it's also new data is showing it's the fifth leading cause of infant mortality worldwide. 
Um, and then phototherapy, just so you understand how it works, is blue light, and it shines through the baby's skin, and it breaks down a, a neurotoxin called bilirubin, and the babies are able to pee it out. But if they, they don't, it can accumulate in the brain and cause brain damage, like cerebral palsy or deafness or even kill a child. So this is what the unmet need for phototherapy looks like. It's about 7 million babies per year. And we, we work this out with Stanford University, but we actually think this is quite conservative. And again, new data that's coming out in the Lancet, we hope, next month, um, will show that it's probably twice this rate. And you can see, again, it's mostly sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. Why is this? Why is this a problem? Because at the, at the end of the day, it's just blue light, right? The main issue is that a standard phototherapy device costs 1,800 pounds. And so this is very, this is too expensive for many of the hospitals that we're seeking to serve. Then there's also this issue of bulbs. You saw this photo earlier. There's six bulbs here. Three of them are burned out. Here's another photo. These are both major urban hospitals in Indian cities. So again, where very sick children are being referred. In this case, the blue bulbs were replaced by white bulbs and some of them are still burned out. So this is partly an issue of cost. Um, as we dug more into the problem, we could see that the cost of, of bulbs, so either six bulbs, five or six bulbs in each device, they need to be replaced two to three times a year. This is the cost per bulb. So in Delhi, it's only eight pounds per bulb, but in Lima, Peru, you're, it's over 30 pounds. In Kampala, Uganda, it's over 100 pounds per bulb. So you're looking at an operating cost per year of over 300 pounds per year in Peru and over 1,300 pounds per year in Uganda. The thing is, is, though, is this is if it's easy to get the bulbs. Remember the supply chain problem we saw with the prosthetics? We see the same thing with the bulbs. It's often hard to source these bulbs. So it's not just a matter of cost, it's a supply chain issue. Um, in one hospital where my colleagues were in Nigeria, they actually saw a white bulb, just a standard room white bulb, that had been painted blue and put into a phototherapy device. So this is brilliant. Um, this was also in a wired issue not that long ago in December, thank you. We designed it with LEDs, and we're certainly not the first group to design a phototherapy device with LEDs, but many of you know the benefits of LEDs. They last 50,000 hours. So the usage rates we see, this is a minimum of eight years before any degrade in performance. Um, also, the great thing with LEDs is they use 40% of the power that a tube bulb phototherapy device would use. Um, and this is important, again, if you're in a hospital that loses power and needs to go on to battery backup. And the thing I should mention is, while we're not the first to use LEDs to do the design, we're probably one of the first to have done optical modeling with the LEDs. And this is important because we want to minimize the number of components in our devices, less things to break, less things to maintain. And so Brilliance is on the market now for about 250 pounds. It's actually in rupees, so I'm always saying approximately. But the great thing, of course, is there's no replacement bulb costs. Um, we have an interesting model for delivery with Brilliance. We licensed it to the largest maker of neonatal equipment in India, Phoenix Medical Systems. They're based in Chennai. They do manufacturing, distribution, sales, marketing. And they also secured the regulatory approval. Um, and that was a picture, actually, of the first lot of Brilliance units. It went on the market about a year and a half ago. Um, this is a snapshot of hospitals that have Brilliance units now. It's in nine countries. As of last night, it's now in 10 countries. Um, and we estimate that over 12,000 babies have been treated. And we do um, a really cool thing where we're able to track the usage, usage of each device. And if you're interested in how we get to this number, we have a very detailed blog post on it on our website. Um, where we want to get, though, is one million babies treated in the next five years. And of our target market, we estimate that this one, of this one million, about 90% of this would not have been treated. The babies would not have been effectively treated otherwise. So I want to end with um, a few of the challenges we've seen with Brilliance. Um, the big one has been around pricing and then trust, consumer trust. Um, what we've seen is that once Brilliance gets sold into an international market with a distributor, then the distributor may mark it up in a way that we can't predict. And in fact, in the Philippines, we saw Brilliance marked up three times. And we didn't design the device for the distributor to make a lot of money on. So now what we found that we're doing is we're getting involved in the screening and selection of distributors for exclusive relationships, um, working with Phoenix to do that. And that's turned out to actually be great for us because we've learned a lot more and gotten market intelligence on areas that we didn't, we didn't think we'd be digging into so quickly. 
The issue around trust has been interesting too, because on the flip side, when there's a very affordable product, um, we've had doctors say, well, what's wrong with it? It's too cheap. Um, and so we've, we've had to learn that, yes, of course, price is tied to perception of quality, but we've also addressed that by leaning on Phoenix's excellent reputation. They're very well known in India, and they're, they're known in general in Asia for very high quality, and that's actually one of the reasons why we approached them originally. The other thing we're learning to do is leverage our early adopters, because they're pretty happy with it so far. So I want to give you a preview of what's to come. We're actually about two months away from launching the next generation of Brilliance, and it's called Brilliance Pro. Um, and it's a much sleeker design, and we're using some even newer state-of-the-art technology, both to improve usability and also to improve manufacturability. So I want to end with this slide. This is a photo of a newborn unit at a large public hospital in Nigeria. And one of the conditions the baby's being treated for is jaundice. Um, but it's being treated here, she's being treated here with sunlight. And sunlight is fine for mild cases of jaundice, but as you can imagine, it poses <laughs> risks for children with severe jaundice because they need to be in direct sun for a long period of time. Um, emerging markets offer risks, but at the same time, they offer huge potential. And that's both for impact and for new models to solve persistent health problems. So thank you very much. Are you going to question me or shall go down? It's a pretty inspiring story. So it's the power of design, really. Yes. It's taking somebody else's assumptions about what an experience is and rethinking the whole process. I think it's understanding the users and what their value is, what, what they see as the value in the product. So does your team see itself primarily as a product team or as a design team or as a, an experience team? Great question. I think we mean design in the big sense of the word. And I, I think more than product, it's ultimately about solving the problem. So for us, that's the impact. So reaching the market, markets that we want to reach, the right users. So if we sell Brilliance, for example, to the Apollo system of hospitals, which is the fancy pants, we have not done our job. And then we want to make sure that they keep using it. So they're using it correctly and they're maintaining it. And you're going into some pretty established organizations and you're challenging the way they think. How much resistance do you get when you go to a, an Indian or an African rehabilitation center or hospital and say, we've got a better way of doing this? Well, we, we actually don't say we have a better way. We, we first are saying, what are you doing now? And what are your pain points? And I would actually say, clinics and hospitals are not the places that give us resistance. It's actually been more of the donor, believe it or not, the donor in the international development community, who I think rightly are a little bit suspect of more products for poor people, <laughs> more products that don't work. And hopefully, we will overcome that. Great work. Thank you, Krista Donaldson. Thank you, David.